from a humanity standpoint, this really could be a game-changing event. Not an iPhone event, not a computer event, a steam engine event, a Wright Brothers event, uh, a diesel engine event, where it just has this universal application that touches not just commercial, but human lives. The team we've put together is really the team that's going to take this to the next level. Rocket Star has a very viable design to get us a reusable single stage to orbit rocket that will bring down the costs of access to space. More and more individuals and companies will have access to uh, doing fantastic stuff that has not been possible in the past. NASA tried to do this in the early 90s. They ran into technical difficulties, but we're 25 years later now, and the ball hasn't been picked up where it was dropped. We're not reinventing the wheel, we're resurrecting it. Rocket Star is building a aerospike engine. That is an altitude compensating engine that will get a reusable launch vehicle to orbit and back without having to drop anything. It's clear that the companies that are on the forefront of this effort to commercialize space exploration are trying to drive towards reusability of the rocket vehicles, bringing these things back to Earth so that they can be retooled and reused without having to build one every single time that you want to go out into space. The narrow spike is an old concept Prototypes were developed, as its name implies, a spike that the thrust is pushed onto. And the thrust, depending on the angle, can give you different types of efficiency. What we're talking about is enabling a single stage to orbit concept, where you don't have to you know, bring just pieces back, but you bring the whole spacecraft back. Pieces of rockets just floating around our, our planet right now in space. <laughs> Environmentally, it would be great to not have all this extra junk, um, but to be able to, to have a reusable resource is always the way to go, in my opinion. On the simulation side, we have uh, you know great computational tools available, which are not available 10 years ago. Uh, we have a you know, great amount of computing power available very, very cheaply. Materials now are much more thermally resistant than they were 40 years ago. What we're doing is using the research that has been done since the 1960s on this particular type of rocket design and bringing it to fruition. We think that the research that we're doing here at Stony Brook, that we've figured out what those technological tall tent poles are. These are sort of solvable problems that will enable this rocket to be a viable launch vehicle. It's now just a question of expertise and manpower. And that we have an overabundance of, especially here at the university. Stony Brook has a, a, a long history in studying the, the, uh, the geology of the solar system. Uh, it goes back to the Apollo program. The lunar uh, module was built on the island. Uh, the first moon rocks were analyzed here at uh, Stony Brook University. And that's continued through to today with our study of, of Mars, of the Moon, of asteroids throughout the solar system. We have a lot of expertise in that, in that area. Some of the best scientists aspire to work at universities. So if you want to get good people, you have to look at not only industry, but also at the universities to make sure you're tapping all the right people. Given the resources that exist in Long Island, if we had a scaled down prototype of an aerospike rocket, conduct a burn test, to see if this design can match some of that performance that has been predicted computationally, and then to see if some of um, the challenges that have been presented in the literature uh, regarding testing and evaluation of these concepts can be replicated in a laboratory environment. One of the designs we made was uh, for this rocket to be liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen as the fuel in a process that has actually been discovered and utilized at NASA. It's very important to understand the uh, water content of Mars to be able to quantify the amount of water in the rocks and to know which regions have the most water so we know where to land. Oceans of water are locked up in the crystal structures of minerals, you know, on Mars. Uh, so there's plenty of water there. Comets are filthy with water. You know, there's, you know, there's water all over the place in, in comets and there's billions of them out there. The hardest part 
is not getting there. The hardest part is getting back in one piece. So if we can do that reliably and use things out there versus having to take it with us, it would totally change the industry as we know it. Spending less money on rockets for spending more money on science, and that's what really excites me. NASA has a budget, a fixed budget. So if you think about you know shrinking the part of the wedge that is money spent on rockets, right, then it opens up a whole new part of that wedge for actually flying more missions. For me as a space scientist, as a geologist, I want more money spent on uh, on satellites in orbit around Mars and the moon than I do on the launch vehicle to get those things there. And this technology, this engine is what is going to enable that. It's uh, low hanging fruit that's right for the picking. People that said they were part of Apollo, all those people that said it was part of this particular program. Now you have a space program that you're a part of. All of this stuff has been invented. We're just like a Lego builder putting it all together and, and sending it out there. The risk takers out there that have always been at the forefront of the entrepreneurial edge are now getting into this game. If there is a critical mass of people that are involved in this project and people that are willing to keep working on this project, then this can, be, then this can become a reality. What we need are the startup funds to actually go uh, finish the, the design and cut metal and do our burn test. And once we do our burn test and we have the data that shows that how efficient this rocket is and, and how much better it is and everything else, then we're golden. This really is happening. <laughs> I mean, you know, kidding aside, egos aside, we're kind of just, you know, the custodians of the next generation of science. But all of the stuff you see on TV is now extremely possible. I've spent uh, since uh, 1959 in the aerospace industry, and I am uh, still in the aerospace industry, and uh, I think this would be a tremendous step forward for it. We're actually all coming together as humans and deciding, okay, this should happen. Let's make it happen together. And I'm really happy that this this actually can can happen, not because of you know an investment bank, not because of a government entity, but because of people. It's people helping other people get to space.